Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! There's only one story in town this week. Strip the tinsel away and there are no awards for guessing what it is. The UK's retreat from Europe is now well underway. And whilst it's not quite Dunkirk, there are certainly parallels. A nation in crisis, a prime minister using their powers of auditory to try to lead from the front in our darkest hour. It's a creature many don't understand, but could perhaps grow to love, such as the shifting shape of water. And there's a horror film called Get Out. You really couldn't make it up. You don't need three billboards to get the message. In the end, though, perhaps it will be a European love story and we should call it by its name, Brexit. If nothing else, it's certainly been a week for big speeches. The Treasury is deliberately playing down this week's spring statement, not so Labour, who will be setting out their vision for the economy later this week. Joining me to talk about what we can expect is the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell. Mr McDonnell, very warm welcome to you. Uh, 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 let's start, shall we, with that? spring statement. Um, you made a speech yesterday in which you suggested that the government needs to, to help struggling local authorities. In what way can they do that? Well, the spring statement does give the Chancellor the opportunity of assessing the income he's had over recent months, and we've seen some improvement in the public finances, which we welcome. I think he should be using some of that now to alleviate the struggling local authorities and it, right the way across the local councils in this country whether they be conservative or con labor controlled to a council they're now saying that they're in well near crisis some of them are already have declared themselves near bankrupt and even in philip hammond's own area in surrey the leader the conservative leader of the council has said they've got a financial crisis facing them and they need some central government assistance because this crisis has been caused by cuts in support from central government to local councils. And it's impacting upon services, I think, in a way which is unacceptable. And I used the example with the Chancellor, both in the budget and last week, about children's services. We've got the highest level of children coming into care since the 1980s. The charities are saying, children's charities are saying, this is a crisis that could turn into a catastrophe. The professionals, the directors of social services are saying we need assistance now. So we're saying, look, of course the management of the economy is absolutely critical. You have to be careful how you manage that. It's in, you balance your income with your expenditure. But now there's a time to start investing in public services. Because, you know, if you cut these services now, it costs more in the future. If, it, early intervention with children, for example, children and families, has been cut by 40%. That means more children are therefore coming into care and that means it's even more expensive. So we're saying there needs to be some assistance to councils now. So it is then something to be celebrated that the government has the extra money to, to, to throw at the local authorities, that we are now, after 10 long years, running a surplus? Well, the, the problem is this, is that we could be running a surplus now if we'd invested in our economy rather than introduced the austerity measures that the Tories did. And... I have to say, I was, I was concerned the way, for example, George Osborne the other day was celebrating for the first time we'd come into surplus, even though he'd missed every target. He said, is it? He'd promised that we were going to eliminate the deficit overall by 2015. He certainly didn't do that. And you know, the people who've suffered as a result of this, they seem, the Conservatives seem to have no consideration for them. There's a million elderly people out there, vulnerable elderly, who are not getting the care that they should have. We've lost 750,000 local government jobs. We've had 500 children's centres closed, 400, over 400 libraries closed. People out there have lost some of the basic fabric of their local communities as a result of the austerity measures, which actually were unnecessary because if we'd have used that money to invest, we would have had a growing economy and we didn't need this scale of austerity. Well, we didn't need austerity in, in the form it's been brought about with these massive cuts. And as I say, I come back to children's services. We're saying to the government, if they don't accept that argument, at least accept what the professionals and the local council leaders are saying, that on children's services, the most vulnerable children in our society are being put at risk as a result of these cuts. Please, I'm appealing to the Chancellor this week 
to actually start investing. And we're, the gap is about two billion by 2020. In, indeed, indeed. If we could put that uh, money in now. We, if we still, put that money in now, we could protect the most vulnerable children. Yep, yeah, still, even despite that, that, that very scathing sentiment, as someone often referred to as an arch strategist within the Labour Party, isn't there a tiny little bit of, of grudging respect that, that Theresa May has done what Jeremy Corbyn has been unable to do and uh, unite the party behind a single position on Brexit? Well, her speech the other day was more about securing a truce a limited truce within the Conservative Party than it was about the interests of the country. And we've already seen today that truce has begun to unravel. You know, Michael Heseltine's statement this morning about the speech, what did he describe it as? As phrases and generalisations and platitudes. We're seeing an attack on Boris Johnson by Gavin Barwell, the, the Prime Minister's own policy advisor. So I don't think the truce is going to last very long. But what worries me, it was more about managing the Conservative Party than it was about the future of the country. And so, what of Labour's position then? We've edged as far as we can, I think, towards, towards knowing exactly what, what Labour's position is, that we have a, a customs union with the European Union, but one which permits us to sign free trade, free trade agreements. When the European Union eventually says, you know, that's not possible, which is the most important to you? That customs union with the EU or the sovereignty and the ability to sign FTAs? Well, I don't believe it is impossible. I think it's perfectly possible. What we're saying is... A it's perfectly customs possible union, that it's not possible as well, so I'm just asking what your priority is. Well, well I'm, I'm optimistic it will happen. And what we'll be able to do is combine the benefits of the custom union, so a, a, a customs union, which means that we will have tariff-free trade, and at the same time we'll be able to negotiate free trade agreements around the world through the strength of partnership with the European Union partners that we have. Now, I think we can secure that. And actually, if we could transform... If we could transform the, the whole tone of the negotiations, I think we could get cooperation on a scale we've not seen so far in these discussions. But I've with, with negotiated respect, in Brussels in my professional life. Indeed, indeed, and, and you're absolutely perfectly placed to answer this question, but you and I both know that that's, that's not an answer. You know, it's fair to ask which you would prioritise, either the, the customs union with the European Union or the ability to sign, uh, to sign FTAs. It, it does look as if you're, you're trying to avoid it. I mean, take Jeremy Corbyn. This week, when he was asked no. about this very, this very topic, he said that his plan B was to keep negotiating for plan A. Does he not understand the concept of a plan B? Well, let me just explain to you then what I was about to say. I've negotiated in Europe. I had an office in Europe. I was a chief executive of a local government association that managed European funds. And if you change the tone of these negotiations, one in which you negotiate on the basis of mutual interest and mutual respect, you can secure, you can secure deals in the benefit of everybody. And that we're not willing to accept, as the Prime Minister seems to think, defeat at the end of this and just walking away. We believe we can secure those negotiated deals. And in talking to our European partners, I believe there's an air of constructive engagement that they want to see that they're not getting from the Conservative Party that they would get from the Labour Party. Aren't you guilty, as guilty of, of cherry-picking, then, as, uh, as Theresa May? Well, in any negotiation, what you seek to do is lay out what your objectives are and then you negotiate around them. Now, whether you call that ch cherry-picking or n negotiation, it's irrelevant. What we're trying to do is ensure... Well, our objectives are clear. They have been from the beginning. Protection of our economy and protection of jobs and respect for the European referendum. We believe we can negotiate a deal which will enable us to do that. We're 18 months on now, and the Prime Minister's speech on Friday barely moved us on a whole range of issues, and in some issues, could really, well, just declined to address them seriously. For example, the Northern Ireland border. Indeed, indeed. Um, oh. I just want to move on to a couple of other topics whilst you have you, and I'm wondering what you think of, of Max Mosley. And I'm not referring to, to the leaflet that was uncovered this week. Instead, yeah. the interview that he gave a few days ago, where he confirmed that he was of the view that it was perfectly legitimate to pay immigrants to go home, to offer them financial uh, incentives, you know, cash for repatriation. I presume that that's not your view. No, certainly not. Of course it's not our view. As and it's the sort of proposals which we've condemned in the past outright.
Should then the deputy leader, Tom Watson, give back the half a million pounds uh, that he has been donated by, by Max Mosley? I mean, I suppose you probably would want him to give it back, given that it's allowed him to build up a, a private office almost the same size as yours and Jeremy Corbyn's. <laughs> well, the money was given to Tom. Tom took that decision. He took that decision on the basis that, I believe, on the basis that Max Mosley's views had changed from years ago. Well, he uh, said Max that they haven't. That's, that's my point, views. though. That's my point, Mr yeah. McDonald, well, that he has actually explicitly said, this well, is my what, view. No, yeah. Please let me finish a sentence, because exactly that's what I was going to address. If those are the same views now, well, Tom will ne really need to consider seriously exactly that relationship with Max Mosley and the finances as well. Because if he is reiterating these views from the past, he clearly hasn't changed. Mm. Um, and then there's, there's Monroe Bergdorf uh, and her relationship with the party. She is your, your party's new advisor on equality. She's also someone who believes that the suffragettes were, were white supremacists. International Women's Day fast approaching. I mean, another view. Is that another view that you share? I, I don't know the individual concerned. I know she's been appointed as one of our advisors. We'll be talking to her about her views and whether these are her real, whether these are just reported views or whether they are the real views, and that will be a matter, obviously, for the, well, her employer. She's employed directly, I believe, by the leader's office. But obviously, what will happen is those views will be taken into account in those discussions. Often, what I've found in a lot of the reportage of people's views by some of the press, they're not necessarily the views of those people, and often they're taken out of context. I'm not sure about this particular issue, so it will be obviously investigated by the, by the leader's office. Um, there's been a lot of focus this week on yourself, a, a couple of interviews, an article in the Financial Times. I mean, there was a quote given there where it seemed to suggest that you've been cultivating an image of a, this, of a bank manager, you know, which to those who know you well is somewhat surprising. I think it was Diane Abbott that, that made that point. I, I mean, I'm wondering, are you really this, this avuncular kind of grandfather figure in his jumper with a pocket full of Wilder's originals? Or does the, does the revolutionary father still, still bubble deep within your veins? I am what you see. Look, people, whatever people say about me, look, I am. I have no side to me. I express my views. Sometimes I express my views very strongly and it gets me into trouble, in the media in particular. Um, but that's the risk you raise when you have honest and principled views that you want to express. What I'm trying to do is be completely straight with people. And, you know, when we had the general election campaign and we published our manifesto, and which I was integrally involved in, we set out our views straight there. And what I've been saying to people, and I've been touring around... Well, I've been doing these economic conferences all around the country, and I've been in the city speaking to asset managers week after week. I was there again last week, just saying to people, look, we're setting out our views in our manifesto. We'll do that for the next election. I've set out our alternative budgeting arrangements as well. There'll be nothing up my sleeve. When we go into government, everyone will know what we're going to do. They'll be able to have confidence, I think, in our proposals and participate in developing them in detail as well. And in that way, whatever image I have is irrelevant. It's about the policies themselves. People can have confidence that, in believing that's exactly what we're going to do. And actually, the, we have an open door policy. So I've been saying, just give the example. I've been saying to asset managers last week, we want you to come in, help us implement these policies. And if you think some of them are wrong, I want you to test them almost to destruction, if you like. And then, if necessary, yes, we will adjust them. If we, you can convince us they're not going to achieve the objectives we want, we'll change them. So it will be a complete open door. And in fact, what I've been saying to meeting after meeting, when we go into government next time, Everybody will be going into government because they'll have their say. Indeed, uh, nothing up the sleeve of that red jumper, which no doubt some people will read into. Uh, very, very briefly, <laughs> Mr McDonald, well, whilst been... we have you, MPs, MPs are going to be receiving a pay rise. Uh, what are you going to do with yours? Well, I, I, use some of my, I use some of my wages for charity and support, and that's what I'll continue to do as well. And whenever I've had a pay rise, I've... I try to do that, uh, and a lot of MPs do that, to be honest, and, and that, I, that isn't a party political point. Across the House, you'll see a large number of MPs will be looking at how they use their income to actually support things in their constituency, and also a lot do a lot on international charities as well. So I'll, I'll be considering that when we get the pay rise as well. John McDonnell, uh, lovely to see you. Thanks for joining us. OK, thank you.